break. Hello, this is Pastor Roy Blight with Beit Mashiach. Uh, we are a Messianic community here in Lake Worth, Florida. And today we're continuing in our uh, series, the Wake Up Call Years. And we're, today we're finishing up, this is part two of the Congregation of Thyatira. This is the fourth church, which, which coincides with the four seals, which we'll be getting into in a moment. But remember that when we're looking at the times of this prophecy of the uh, Church of Thyatira, Every one of these messages are for the entire body of Messiah, the entire body of Christ. And we, we need to understand that it's at different points during these seven years. So with that understanding, let us begin our getting into it here. And as we look at Thyatira, we understand that this is during the middle years. Things are getting very rough for the body of Christ. And because they're getting pretty rough, uh, things are happening within the body of Christ to make the body of Christ that much better because persecution hits. Persecution always brings out the best in the believers of Jesus. And, it, you know, the Lord uses that to purify us. So we've gone now through, we're about halfway through the last seven years. And as we look through the last seven years, we realize that lots of things will be happening. There'll be war, there'll be pestilences breaking out, there'll be false religions, false Christs, false, false messiahs. But what, what it comes down to is you and I need to really focus on our relationship with the Lord. We must return to our first love, and everything stems from there. So as we enter back into what we were discussing last week, we're looking at Daniel's 70th week, the wake-up call years. This is the last seven years prophesied and promised to the, the Jewish people it, that they would get to know their Messiah, who is Jesus, who is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and these last seven years are meant to draw them into some kind of faith and understanding because he is the only hope of salvation, not just for the Jews, but for the entire world. And they're going to have their opportunity to understand this and know this and enter into this world. So this is about halfway through the seven years, we'll call it year four, could be four stages, doesn't really say exactly how it'll be broken up, but this is year four, the church at Thyatira. And this is a very important uh, church because it's the middle church. It's right in the middle of all that's happening. It's at this time that we're talking, looking at the abomination that causes desolation. It's We're looking at the time when the Jewish people in Israel realize that the Antichrist is not the Christ and all kind of hell is going to break loose. So this is part two. And remember the first four seals that Jesus showed us is the, the, the spirit of what's going to be happening in the last seven years. And they, they coincide perfectly with the seven churches of Revelation. Remember, you had your white horse representing the false apostles. You had your red horse representing war breaking up. Then you had your black horse, which represented the falling of the economies of the world. And then by the time we get to the middle of it, the pale horse or the green horse is the horse that represents all kind of death breaking out, all kind of things happening because planet Earth is going to be under the judgment hand of God during these last days. And he wants everybody to come to faith in Jesus before it's too late. So we look at this, and we, they all coincide, they all come together, and we look at this in such a way, but remember, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. These are letters from Jesus to the seven churches. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen, and these letters were specifically written to the believers in the last days so that they can get a heads up on what to expect during this terrible time known as the Great Tribulation Period. So the time is short. I believe we're heading into that right now. We can, some people believe that we may be into it already. I wouldn't argue with them. But understand, we're right there at the precipice of all of this. And you and I need to understand these are biblical times we're living in right now. The time is short. Satan knows his time is short. Satan's doomed. He's dead. He's He knows he's going to be bound up and sent into the pit for a thousand years. So understand that this is very important things in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. The book of Revelation, of course, is a countdown to the end, and this is how we're approaching it today because these seven churches are the church of Christ during these last seven years. All seven of them count. Now, when you go to Daniel 9, the same thing is talked about, but about these last seven years given to the children of Judea in order that they can see and understand what is going to happen. And there we are right now studying the last seven years, and it's portrayed again by the seven churches. 
So as we wrapped up last time, we we're talking about the beast. The beast with seven heads and ten horns. The beast is a worldwide system that's going to look to take over planet Earth in the last days. It's going to make all the other principalities and spirits bow down to it. And it's going to be running things for a while before the coming of the Lord. It'll be Jesus' biggest enemy in the last days. In Revelation 13, 3, it says, And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed after the beast. This is a system that suffered this mortal head wound. Now, the healing of the head of the beast does appear to be the reemergence of the Islamic Ottoman Caliphate. Muslims represent one quarter of all the people on the earth. They, of course, they're going to have a big part to play in the last day scenario. And here's a question. We talked about the altar of Zeus and at Pergamum. With the altar of Zeus, the seat of Satan, used for human sacrifice in the past, with Adolf Hitler openly using it for the murder of six million Jews and millions of others, what will the altar of Zeus, the seat of Satan's human sacrifices, look like during the last seven years before the Messiah returns? The world is moving quickly and violently into the Great Tribulation. There's going to be death all over. That is why this pale horse, this green horse, is labeled as a horse that represents death, because this is going to be the hallmark of this time, this midway point in the last seven years. And this is what we're going to be seeing. So planet Earth is going to be in turmoil. Everywhere you look, things are going to be turned upside down. I, I would venture to say that things the way they are right now with who's in charge, what nations are stronger than the others, that could all very well change in a very short time. So we need to understand that the word of God is true, and it's all coming to pass even right before our eyes. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is in the last days, these last seven years, is the rise of global Christian persecution. This is a big theme here and a hallmark because the devil hates anything that belongs to God. And the devil is going to declare war openly on the children of God. And we see this taking place. We see this We see this throughout the first three churches that are talked about. But now as we get into Thyatira, we see it taking a big, a big step toward total elimination of anything that belongs to Jesus Christ. The lives of all believers in Yeshua the Messiah will be targeted. Remember that. These seven letters are all written to all believers at the specific point in time represented in the last seven years. So right now we're in the middle and we're seeing things are getting really out of hand. We're seeing things are, are getting really rough for the believer in Jesus. But this has all been told that it will happen. We must brace ourselves for the days ahead. Ephesus, remember, the church at Ephesus, the first of the seven, was about identifying false prophets. That was the first seal. The second seal, the church at Smyrna, was about war and persecution exploding on earth. This is the second seal, and war is ready to break out all the time, everywhere on planet earth, even right now. The church at Pergamos sees the persecution deepen, the, the persecution of the Christians, the believers in Jesus. It deepens, but also has a reference concerning food. Third seal, we're starting to see worldwide famine take hold. Then in the church at Thyatira. When we're getting right near the three and a half year point, Thyatira introduces the Great Tribulation, the fourth seal. Some people have the mistaken notion that the entire seven years is the Great Tribulation. No, the, the, the Great Tribulation, the real bad part of it, is the last three and a half years. And this is where planet Earth is heading at this point in time during the seven churches. So we see the behold, the pale horse or green horse, this horse that represents death. And we know that it coincides with the beast with seven heads and ten horns that is going to rise and is arising, actually, even as I speak. In Revelation 6, 8, we read, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. Now in the Greek, again, pale was written as chloros, which when translated means green. And this is the, you have to understand that this is the color of Islam. That's their official color of, of Islam. Now, so we go back to this. I think it's, a, it's an amazing uh, sign for us to understand even this color, what it represents, because we're seeing this rise all around us, and many in the church today don't see it at all, but there it is. Green is the universally identifiable color of Islam. 
and notice the colors of the flags of the Islamic nations. You'll see a, a pattern. You see many of them have green in it, but they'll also have the other three colors of the horses. You'll see the white, you'll see the black, you'll see the red. Notice that the Lord is the one who is, is going to be identifying his enemies, and they're going to be identifying who they consider to be their enemies, and their enemies are the followers of Jesus Christ. Revelation 6 says, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, or green horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now we know that one-fourth of the world's population today is Islamic. So we see that this is actually a fulfillment already right in our midst of who the people are that are under the, 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 the bondage of Islam. And we see that it's out there. It's a very powerful spiritual force. And I've studied uh, Islamic prophecy, and it coincides with what we're studying, only it's like a, an inverted way of looking at it, because the Antichrist and the Mahdi are actually the same people, and just describes them doing the same things. So we're looking at Islam, the rise of Islam in the last days. Now, Islam's been around since the 600s, but to rule the earth and to take over the uh, the power of the earth, this is what we're going to be seeing, the emergence of Islam. So I believe the last day's beast with seven heads and ten horns is Islam. And every other force, all the, the red horses, the, uh, the European nations, the Asian nations, and then whatever's left of the Western nations will all come underneath the power of Islam at some point in time during these last seven years. This beast will engulf the Middle East, Israel, and the world into a spiral of death, and hell will be the result for millions, probably billions of people. So this is what we're looking at when we're looking at Thyatira. Now, the beast system of death has already captured one-fourth of the world's population. We see it. It's right there in Scripture. And once unleashed, Islam will fulfill every prophecy in God's word about the last day's assault on God and his people and his land. It's all being fought for even right now. And we see that in the sea of Islamic nations, there's little old Israel smack in the middle of all of them. And people don't seem to understand that this rise of the beast in the last days has a lot to do with Islam. So when we look at the troubles that are going on in Israel today and the, the, the situation that you have with all the nations around her, this is at the center of what is happening in the last days as well. So we see that Islam is, is a centerpiece of what's going on. Now, let us now get into what it is talking about spiritually, because we need to understand that we are overcomers. The Church of Thyatira describes overcomers as well. And it says in Revelation 19.7, this needs to be our attitude as believers in Jesus. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. You see, we need to understand that as true believers in Jesus, we're the bride. We're the, we're the ones that are getting our robes prepared. This, the, the heat of this last seven years on the believer is meant to help you to get your life in a place where you can be the bride of Christ yourself. In, in the fourth year of the 70th week of Daniel, the body of Messiah is now much smaller in size but much stronger in their faith due to the purifying heat of persecution. That's why allow, the Lord allows persecution to come in the midst of his people so we can be purified. This persecution is to purify the body of Christ. Revelation 2 says, verse 18, And to the angel of the church at Thyatira, write, These things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass, Whenever you see brass mentioned in Scripture, it's always talking about judgment and refinement. This brass is looking at the body of Christ and how we are able to be refined and purified by what we're going through. And he, he, the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, he sees through everything we're about, and he's getting his people ready for these days. Remember, 
We have our victory in Jesus. Our victory is not in politics. Our victory is not in wars. Our victory is in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he's the one we keep our eyes upon in these last days. Revelation 2.19 says, this is the, what the Lord is telling to the people in the church at Thyatira. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as, your, as for your works, the last are more than the first. So by this time, having gone through half of the seven years, the church is being refined, it is being perfected, it is, it is coming through through fire, and it's coming out on the other side, purified by the Lord himself. The Lord uses all this persecution to get us right. In 2 Timothy 2.19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knows you, if, and if you're his, you know him, and he wants us to depart from iniquity. It doesn't matter what we're going through. We can even be going through the great tribulation. It's still about us getting our hearts and our lives right before the Lord, because he's the one, he's the ultimate judge, and he's the author and the finisher of our faith. You know, this, this theme of being refined is constant throughout the scripture. It says in Proverbs 17, 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but Jehovah is the examiner of hearts. So no matter what we are going through as believers in Jesus, it's not about what happens outwardly. It's what's going on inside of us. And this persecution that is going to be heavy during this time of the midway point of the seven years is like a refining pot for silver and furnace for gold. We will be refined by this fire, by this heat. We get better. The, the, the Church of Thyatira, their works, love, service, faith, and patience are precisely the opposite of what was cited by the Lord in the letter to the first church at Ephesus, you'll notice. Now understand, when this thing starts out, the church is not what it was in the middle part. You are made perfect by what you're going through. You're made mature. When the seven years starts, the church is, they, they have to return to their first love. A lot of people are, are hung up and they they know what's wrong, but they really don't know what's right. By the time the, of the midway point in the seven years, the church is getting its act together now, and the persecution has brought us to heal as to who we are supposed to be in Christ. We are supposed to be the righteousness of God. We're supposed to be the ones who look like Jesus on planet Earth, and this is the point. So remember in the church at Ephesus, it says, have you lost your first love? And then we see this flame of fire is upon us, and the feet like brass, the judgment hand of God. Both speak of the refining fire these saints at Thyatira have been through. When we go through this kind of persecution, you see the Lord is working with his people no matter what. And some people are discovering this even now. There's places in Africa and the Middle East and Asia where persecution is rife. And you see that it's everywhere. These believers are strong believers. These believers that have been going through this kind of persecution, you're either strong or you're dead. And this is basically where the Church of Christ is going to be during midway point of this last seven years. Now, remember last week we talked about Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel. And this is a big theme in the, for the Church of Thyatira, and we need to understand this. So we look back to Jezebel in Revelation 2.20. It says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit some sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So you shrug your shoulders and say, what is this talking about? Well, let's look at this because this is an important theme for the church of Thyatira. It's also an important theme of what's going on in the body of Christ right now. So let us look at some of the characteristics of the Jezebel spirit. Many people have heard of the Jezebel spirit. They, they always think it's this one woman. It's much, this, in this case, it's much bigger than just one person. It's a spirit that is within the church. It's a spirit that is within the world, and it is prevalent during the last seven years. In Bible prophecy, women are used as symbols of the religious systems. Remember, we're the bride of Christ. That's where the Lord's favored. We're the bride. And we know that the, the, the wife is making herself ready. But we also know that a harlot is also speaking of a harlot congregation or a harlot religion. Now, the scripture 
clearly states that Jezebel is a prophetess. So this is some kind of a religious entity that we're looking at. And we want to look at this closer to see exactly what we're talking about. We Last week, I mentioned that there's a, this, this move called Chrislam, where they're trying to merge Christianity and Islam, which no real Christian or no real Muslim would put up with in the first place. But they're trying to bring these things together. This is a, a compromising spirit, but if there's something bigger going on behind even that. That is, Jezebel thinks she hears from God, and she teaches her mistaken theology to the people. That's what you see here. You see people that are into Chrislam, they, they swear that it's right. Oh, we all got to get together. This is not what the Bible teaches at all. This Jezebel, this religious system, a so-called prophetess, does lead the bondservants of the Lord astray. There are many people that would call themselves Christians that are part of this new world religion that was inaugurated in 2017, ahead by the Pope and all the other religions of the world. This is apostate. This is antichrist. There's nothing good about it before the Lord. Yet many people think that this is the way we are supposed to go. No, 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 no. Understand that that is the spirit of antichrist. That's the devil's religion. Compromise is always in the heart of the people who serve the devil. This Jezebel spirit does this by encouraging the saints to sin. Again, by eating things sacrificed to idols and by sexual immorality. One of the great ways that you see this, this happening even today in the church is all of a sudden people are allowed to sleep around. They can do whatever they want. Nobody questions anybody that is uh, sleeping around. They, they, they don't question anything that has to do with homosexuality. Even though in the Old and the New Testament, homosexuality is an abomination before the Lord, most people in the church aren't even ready to discuss it. They accept it all. You can, you can sleep with anybody. That's what this is talking about. This is that Jezebel spirit that has that has mesmerized the body of Christ and most of the world into thinking that all these things are going on. Listen, the depravity that we see out there is evil. It is sin against the Lord. And the Lord has turned over. Our, he's turned us over to our own depravity. And now the world is in such confusion. They don't know what's coming next. They're trying to change the way we talk, they're trying to change the way we think, they're trying to change the way we can't even look at people and say that's a boy or a girl anymore without coming under some kind of opposition. That's insanity. That's crazy. But that's that spirit of Jezebel that is encouraging the saints to sin and is eating things sacrificed to idols and it's in sexual immorality. Nobody even talks about immorality anymore, especially sexual immorality. Listen, these are all abominations before the Lord. And this Jezebel spirit, this great principality, it's a spirit, is right there encouraging believers to sin and to fall away from the Lord. Other things that are out there, the global warming deception, understand that all of this is meant to get you away from faith in Jesus Christ, and it is meant to get you to be panicked in order that you'll have to go along with things that they say is going to help the world. Listen, the, whatever climate change is going on, and usually it's cyclical, if anything, it's the judgment of God preparing the world for what's coming next, and people need to wake up and pay attention to this. So we see all of these things coming to pass right now, the insanity that's out there, the false ecumenical religion that's out there that is being foisted be all over the place. It is not of God. It is not of Jesus. It is the enemy of Jesus. And we need to understand exactly what is happening. So, of course, in the middle of all of this, we find that uh, Islam is very much involved with this. They don't, they don't openly broadcast it much because they still have a, an Islam, they still have a sense you're not supposed to sin. But in, in Saudi Arabia right now, there's a super city proposed called Neom, which is 33 times larger than the city of New York City and is being put together right now. It's very high tech. And people are, are thinking, wow, this is a great thing. Listen, this is all part of the last day's scenario. Islam is on the rise, and Islam will take over at some time, but understand these things are happening even right now. So note, Jezebel herself is not an adulteress. In order to be an adulteress, Jezebel would have to be Jewish and go away from Judaism. She would have to have been married to the Lord in order to be an adulteress. That's not Jezebel. She was never Jewish. She was never an Israelite. She was not, she was, she was from Sidon. She was not Jewish at all. However, she encourages believers to commit spiritual adultery. And that's the point. 
because the spirit of Jezebel that's out there is wants to control people and wants to get them away from any kind of faith in the true God of the Bible. And we see everything that has happened is getting people to the place where they want to walk away from Jesus. This is her job. This is what she does. So this is a very important distinction that I'm mentioning to you right here. So what religion does Jezebel represent? It can't be Judaism or even apostate Christianity because she was never part of that in the first place, because then they would be committing spiritual adultery. This is not what Je who Jezebel is. This is not her role. And we see that in the, the context of the Middle East, where you have Israel and you have the Islamic nations surrounding Jerusalem on every side, the only one left, this leaves Islam, perhaps with a corrupted New World Order religious establishment led by Islam and or the Vatican helping them out and the United Nations et al. as the most logical remaining enemies of the cross. So let us go back to the life of Jezebel to try and understand this because this is an important link that I want to leave with you today. See, Jezebel in the scripture, if you read about her, you'll find amazing things. It says in 1 Kings 16, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. So Jezebel was never Jewish. She was never an Israelite. She was from Sidon, which is modern-day Lebanon, and she and her, she was one of the daughters of Eth Baal. She was a Baal worshiper, front and center. And you know, even today we see the rise of Baal worship in our world. I remember just a couple of years ago they had they on the, the uh, Empire State Building, they were advertising and, and glorifying Baal worship, and that Baal worship is back, and people were like, wow, this is great. I didn't know so many, many Christians saying anything against it either. Listen, Baal is an enemy. The spirit of Baal is an enemy to the Lord our God, and this, this rising of Baal in the last days is very much part of the last day scenario, because understand that the spirit of Antichrist, which is going to take in all the other spirits that are against Christ, and he's going to put them together for the battle that's coming when Jesus comes back. They're setting up their defenses, and we're seeing it even right now in our world. Now, let's look at this, this, this Baal some more. Let's, I want to introduce you to the ancient Arabian god Hubal. Hubal was an, was an ancient Arabian moon god that was worshipped in pre-Islamic Arabia at the Kaaba in Mecca prior to Allah. Now, Hubal represents the strongest deity that led all the other 360 gods and goddesses that had, uh, that had uh, idols in the Kaaba in Arabian mythology. So, Hubal was one of 360 gods that they worshipped. Have you ever wondered where the crescent moon in Islam came from? It came from Hubal. The moon god Hubal was also referred to as Al-Ilah, Allah. And understand, this is the, the heart of what is going on today, because these foreign, ancient, demonic deities are at the forefront. Now, you ever the crescent moon in Mecca, the star and crescent was the emblem of the Ottoman Empire. This is the symbol of Islam, but it's also a symbol of the Ottoman Empire, which I believe is a front and center in the Bible prophecies concerning the Antichrist coming in. The, the Lucer Luciferian symbol that is there, the, this crescent moon, this crescent pagan carving of the solar star deity Baal Haddad, depicted as a disc and a crescent. So you can see it goes all the way back, this pagan worship of Hubal. We want to understand what we're looking at. Ahab served Baal, Baal, and his wife Jezebel was the daughter of Eth Baal. Yahweh and Baal are bitter enemies. The spirit of Baal is very prevalent and out there and is strong in all of the pagan religions that are there, but they're all tied together. There is obvious speculation that Allah, 
the God of the Muslims, and Baal are one and the same. If you look at the history, you can see it perfectly clear. Pagan Arabs in Mecca worshipped a moon god called Hubal at the Kaaba. This is before Islam in, six, in the 600s. Now, the moon god Hubal is, comes actually, it was also in Hinduism, or, or Hala, or if you spell Hala backwards, you get Allah. And this is the, and was depicted as a devotee of the god Shiva. Shiva is the goddess of destruction, and the, the god of Shiva, the Kaaba, was worshipped that way. Hubal was the lord of the Kaaba, being the highest ranking god of the 360 gods worshipped in the Kaaba. And we see today in CERN in, in, uh, in Europe, we see the dance of Shiva at the, at the opening of uh, the CERN gates there. You see Shiva is depicted there, the goddess of destruction. And, she, and you have to understand that this, is a, this spirituality that's out there is absolutely antichrist. And it is setting up right before our eyes. They think they're going to win. But I'm telling you, when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy all his enemies. So understand that what, all the turmoil that we're seeing today, all the murkiness and all the spirituality that is out there, it's all meant to drive Christians away from the cross, and it's all meant to hoodwink, and it's all meant to deceive the people of the world. It became customary that Hubal, who was the pagan Arab god, addressed their prayers to, later just called on Allah. This is where it really came from. And we see the beast is Baal. And the moon is Islam's symbol. This is who Allah is. It's the god of the moon and the crescent, the, the god of the sword. Allah, Hubal, and Baal essentially are the same god. When you look at it, they are, they're actually talking about the same thing. Keep in mind, the historic Jezebel does not represent apostate Christianity. She was never Jewish. She was never Christian at all. She was a Sidonian, and she was a Baal worshiper. The Baal cults of Ahab and Jezebel are still out there, and they've changed names, they've changed some locations, but it's still the same thing. And she was a pagan. She wasn't an apostate. She was not an apostate. Jezebel was a pagan from Sidon. She was not an apostate Jewess. The name Jezebel means, where is the prince? You say, well, what does that even mean? Well, let's look at that even a little farther. This phrase, where is the prince? was a ritualistic cry among Baal worshippers when they could not meet with Baal because he was in the underworld. Yes, he's been tied up, literally, for thousands of years, and they would call out to Baal, where's the prince? They couldn't find him. And this is their deity that is looking to get out in, in, the, in the world even today. And this is what is prophesied in the book of Revelation when these spirits from the underworld are let loose for a time during the Great Tribulation period. This phrase would be shouted to usher him, Baal, onto the earth. The shout is very akin to the beast that comes out of the abyss in Romans 9. And you have to and look what it says. Je Jezebel was instrumental in swindling the vineyard of Naboth. The name Naboth means <clears throat> fruit producer. And look, you look at the story, you can see the thievery that goes on, and you see the thievery that that think they're getting away with something, but they're really not. Jezebel had two false witnesses accuse Naboth of blasphemy. You know, if you, and we see this today, you'd be held on a charge of blasphemy if you say something against Allah. Well, you know what? He's not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Then they had Naboth stoned to death in order to acquire his vineyard. This is a perfect picture of when the Antichrist will accuse the saints the true fruit producers, of blasphemy for not bowing down to Allah or Baal or the New World Order at all or any of the other false phony deities that are out there. We will not bow down to another God. We belong to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And the, this, this confederation is being put together even right now, and it is aimed at putting away all dissent, especially from Bible-believing Jews and Christians who are Bible believers as well. This the Antichrist, his conspiracy, and the final eighth empire. This, this, this is a good book about this exact subject. And understand, these are the days we're moving into. Now, lastly, it was in the days of Jezebel that the prophet Elijah caused no rain to fall for three and a half years. 
Doesn't this sound like something that could take place in the seven churches of the book of Revelation? And he caused no rain. And so they were having a great famine in the land. Now look at God's economy. Look at God's arithmetic here. You had Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. And this is, fight is still going on. After the Lord promised to restore rain to the land, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mark, Mount Carmel, if you remember. Elijah taunted the 450 prophets of Baal. Then fire came down on his sacrifice, and the 450 prophets of Baal were put to death. Now, this angered Jezebel, and this caused great upheaval in the land because everybody saw that it was obvious that Jehovah God, the Lord our God, is, is God, and that all these Baal worshipers were worshiping a false god. It is certain that during these times, in the, as we go forward into the last seven years, during these times, the two witnesses begin to rise up to challenge the powers that be, that are out there. This is going to be a time of great upheaval. Jezebel will be leading God, will be leading God's people astray into the fourth year. And the spirit of Jezebel, I'm not talking about any person in particular, I'm talking about this demonic entity, this principality called Jezebel that, that is leading and will lead Christian people away from Jesus in these last days. If you're not the real deal, you need to understand you're going to be falling for some great excesses that are out there aimed at you even right now. So this is what we're seeing. We're looking at a spiritual battle. We're looking at all kinds of things. So we want to understand what this Jezebel spirit, this Jezebel uh, principality is all about. Again, Jezebel was a prophetess of Baal. Her name is Phoenician for unhusbanded. Even if married, she is the boss. She, she wants control. She will control. Her spirit is rebellious, self-loving, and devoid of empathy. Jezebel loves what, she, what God hates and hates what God loves. Her spirit seeks to use, manipulate, and destroy lives. She, we need to be able to discern, pray against this demonic spirit, Jezebel, because this is part of what is going to be hammering the body of Christ as we get to the middle of the seven years. This is going to be out there. Islam is going to be doing what it does. The spirit of Jezebel, which is part and parcel of Islam, it's also part and parcel of the Vatican. It's also part and parcel of the uh, apostate ecumenical movement. It's part and parcel of the new world religion. Remember, only Jesus Christ saves. Now, it stands to reason that Jezebel is leading some believers into Islam, a false demonic spirituality, and away from faith in the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. We, we see that happening even right now. Now, Sharia law is already being promised to the planet if Islam, if Islam takes over everywhere. Things are going to change. Remember that Islam has strict halal dietary laws as well. So it's going to, they have a way of life in Islam that is very uh, covers every aspect of life. Islam also has laws allowing for sexual slavery. So there's a lot going on there as well we want to be aware of. In these trying times, halfway in, into the fourth year now, in these trying times, believers may simply give in to Islam because they cannot face death. In this fourth year, Yeshua will begin to punish Islam, or whoever this B system is, with pestilence. And this is one of the things that you see as we study the church at Thyatira. We see that there's going to be pestilence breaking out, and it's going to be aimed at specific people. So look what it says in the fourth seal here. And this is in Revelation 6, 7, and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, florals, green horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. So it's going to be all-encompassing. There's going to be death on every hand. And we see in particular, the Middle East is going to be really wrapped up in this. In Revelation 2.22, it says, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, 
unless they repent of their deeds. So this, this pestilence is aimed specifically at these people who are involved with what they're doing. Revelation 2.23 says, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. So the Lord is telling the church, you hang in there. Look what I'm doing to them. You hang in there, and I'm going to reward you according to how well you're handling this lifestyle, this persecution that's going on all around you. So we need to understand today what is apostasy. You see, Islam has been around since the 7th century, so Muslims have had ample time to repent and come to Jesus, and some have. In fact, there's great moves of the Lord now, like in Iran, where people are getting saved miraculously. Yeshua's patience with Jezebel, or Islam, or false worldwide religion, is about to come to an end. The battle lines have been drawn, the swords have been put out of their sheath, and Jesus is ready to deal with them. And we see this is happening. If you remember back in Daniel chapter 2, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the last thing was the, the, the feet with the, the toes of clay and, and of uh, iron, that the, the rock came out of nowhere, out of, out of the sky, and, and smashed all the systems of the world, hit him in the feet. And this is what you're looking at now. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to deal with his enemies and deal with them powerfully. So we see all kinds of things happening that are going to point toward this. Islam will come under the judgment of pestilence from the Lord. And this is to teach the church that Yeshua is Lord in total control of everything. This will be a sign for the believers because they're going to see how the Lord is going to deal with those who deal against the church and who are against them. The Lord does what he is going to do. And when he says he's going to do it, he will do it. So when you give a, you want to give a, a, a title to this church of Thyatira, some theologians would call it the tolerant church. Well, that's a, that makes sense because the tolerant church is a church that's given up its authority. It's given up its place and just wants to get along with everybody. Well, that's from the spirit of Jezebel. That's what the spirit of Jezebel will do to the true believers. This pestilence seems to come right at the Muslim world that we're looking at in the scripture here. And this is how the body of Messiah will see God's hand in action. So this is when you look at this. Jesus is getting his people prepared, and he's allowing us to go through all kinds of horrific things. But guess what? doesn't matter. If, you, if you're martyred during this time, if you make it through during this time, all the way up to the rapture, understand that the Lord has his hands on his people. And that's the point here in Thyatira. Revelation 2.26 says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. If you can make it through this, you're going to be something in the kingdom of God because you're going to be given power over the nations. You're going to be given authority when Jesus comes back. And it's going to be an amazing switch when you see all that the Lord is going to do for our people. But this is a spiritual battle. And we see in Psalm 91, it, it is also something that is, is pronounced for all of us that are followed, that follow Jesus. We are promised the victory. It says in Psalm 91, 7 and 8. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it, shall but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. And you can see this is actually looking at what the church of Thyatira was looking at when God is judging all of the false religions, and he's looking at his people, allowing them to see what he's doing to the false religions at the same time. So this is a picture of exactly what the Church of Thyatira is all about in Psalm 91. Then it goes on and says, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. This is the context of the scripture many people quote. This is talking about during a time of persecution, the Lord is taking care of his enemies. He's pouring out his pestilence upon his enemies. And no evil will befall those who are following Jesus. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Revelation 2 states that those who commit adultery with Jezebel, which is Islam, will be thrown into great tribulation. Be very clear. Those Christians who think they can live alongside the Muslim world will be judged along with them. 
despite their passivity. You being passive doesn't mean that you're kind or humble. It means you're being passive and you're actually don't, you actually don't know what you say you believe in. You don't know the Lord. You wouldn't do that otherwise. So this is what we're looking at. And all these things are being set up even right now, but it's going to reach ahead. And when you get to the middle of the seven years, lots of things are going to be happening. Lots of people are going to be dying. The Christians are going to be targeted. Ravening wolves in sheep's clothing are going to be amongst the people of God. Agents of the Antichrist. They're being set up even right now, and they're all over the place. You need to come to grips with who you are in Jesus. Remember, the Great Tribulation is the wrath of the Antichrist and his followers. That's his wrath. It's not the wrath of God. Not yet. Jesus hasn't returned yet. We've not seen the rapture. Then you'll see the wrath of God. But right now you're seeing the wrath of the Antichrist. And we're right in the middle of all this as we study the seven churches of Revelation. That's why it says in Revelation 2.24, Now to you I say, to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. He's going to allow them to come through this thing. So he says, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. So we want to hold fast what Jesus has given to us. And that's where I'm going to end it here today. And we're, we're finished now with the, the Church of Thyatira. We're moving into the last seven years. And it's, it, th these things are very exciting. It's going to be daunting for the true believer in Jesus. Many of, many of us will be martyred. Many of us will be imprisoned. Lots of things are going to happen. But understand, at the end of time, Jesus comes back, and he is Lord. And we need to remain faithful and hold fast that which he's given to us. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.